All right, so now we're going to talk about the SDN stack. In particular, we're going to focus on the switches and the controllers. Just give you a brief window into the controllers, but later this afternoon, you'll hear more details. So here's a picture. Starts out with open flow switches, or in a more generalized SDN vision, some kind of switch that has a forwarding abstraction. This could be on top of a modified firmware for the router, or like the router you buy that implements an access point. It can be a little embedded PC. It can be something like OpenV switch that you install on top of Linux or Zen, something that provides a virtual switch. It can be Broadcom. It can be commercial uh, commodity silicon. It could be the OpenFlow software switch or something like a NetFPGA, reconfigurable hardware that runs at line rate on a few ports, as well as commercial switches from lots of vendors increasing in number. Optionally, you have a slicing layer with something like FlowVisor to slice up access to the network and slice up the view. You have a controller. Here you have your choice. Here are just a few examples. I'm going to list a few more in about 10 minutes. All kinds of applications slotting in on top. And then your monitoring and debugging tools, which we're going to talk about a little more this afternoon. And in fact, you'll get experience in playing with those in the hands-on session if you haven't already. All right, so I'll talk about some switches. These are all OpenFlow 1.0 for now. But I think there are prototypes coming out soon that are going to be for later versions that add additional features. So as of 2010, this is a slightly old slide. OpenFlow had been implemented on the following hardware. It had been implemented at the bottom right on a mixed optical and packet switch. It had been op implemented at the bottom left. That's a Prono switch on uh, basically a box wrapping Broadcom hardware. PC engines on the bottom right. It's an access point. We have a bunch of those deployed at Stanford. NEC has a WiMAX implementation, kind of unique. Uh, so HP has their Procurve chassis switches. That's another form factor to get OpenFlow. Uh, there are a bunch of other 1U boxes, like those from Netgear and NEC, as well as the Juniper MX there was a prototype on. And actually, since 2010, I know there are more, but I can't possibly keep track of every development. So ask your vendor what they offer. And the more times you guys ask, the more likely they are to actually deliver. All right. So mention some of those switches. Uh, I'll just cover briefly some of the notes. So there may be limitations to what you can do on some of these switches. And some of them come from what the forwarding hardware can do. There's just no way to work around it sometimes. So an example is the HP Procurve has to do a few things in software that some other platforms do in hardware. Uh, another thing is a lot of these switch implementations, the firmware doesn't support everything. Actually, this has changed for uh, PK8 at the bottom. They do support, with their XOR Plus, a whole bunch of other uh, protocols alongside OpenFlow. But not all of them do. And there are all kinds of open switches. These are ones you can modify. So the OpenFlow reference is effectively dead at this point. Uh, that was the original. Nasira now does, uh, maintains OpenV switch uh, at openvswitch.org. That's faster than the Stanford reference, even though it's out there probably don't want to use it because it's not supported. It's not as fast either. Uh, so Indigo is an example of an open switch. It is effectively C code plus Lua bindings that allow you to run a pure open flow switch on top of Broadcom hardware, where that hardware may be sold by uh, multiple vendors, so multiple box packaging vendors. And uh, XOR Plus, PK8 does on top of Pronto boxes. That's not quite as open as the others. You have to send them an email to get the source code, but they assert that it's open. So ignore these slides. Just ask your vendor for the latest information, because as soon as it's printed, it's out of date. All right, so a few things that you can and you cannot do with OpenFlow switches today. You should be aware of the limitations, because there are applications where OpenFlow, at least in 1.0, is simply incapable of representing the matching you need to implement that application. And there are others where the performance of the switches may not support a flow rate high enough for you to implement your idea. So they're both practical limitations as well as interface limitations. They're being addressed. So one thing you, uh, with OpenFlow 1.0 is that you can't do per packet networking. So something like a mesh network 
probably wouldn't make a lot of sense to do with OpenFlow or any operation that you do on a per packet basis rather than a per flow basis would be pretty tough. But one way to think of it is that OpenFlow can provide the plumbing to connect these systems. Another one is using all the tables on switch chips. So Broadcom hardware, for example, has a layer two table, a layer three table, an ACL table, which is a TCAM, and it actually has a bunch of these on uh, multiple processors within the chip that have different forwarding actions that they all support. OpenFlow, because it's trying to be least common denominator, can't support all of these forwarding actions. In fact, the interface means that you may not be able to take that interface and map it in the most efficient way onto the hardware resources that you have. But OpenFlow 1.1, one of the big deals about it is that it gives an interface to expose more details about what that porting pipeline should be, which gives the switch implementer a way to map, say, a description with, here's my layer two table, here's my layer three, and here's my ACL, onto those resources if there is a way. It doesn't guarantee that the switch will implement it or that it'll support all those tables, but it at least provides an interface to get started. And it avoids this cross-product problem that you have with a single table that you should be really aware of, which is, if you're doing things on layer two, and you're doing things on layer three headers, you can't separate these out. You have to consider the cross product of those two and push that into a flow table if you only have a single interface. And if there isn't a strict ordering of if you do something at layer two, then you're done, or if you do something at layer three, then you're done. If you want to do something for layer two and then for layer three, uh, a multi-stage pipeline, OpenFlow 1.1 gives you that flexibility. So other things you cannot do with OpenFlow 1.0. So one is it doesn't define ways to add forwarding primitives. It does provide a nice way to integrate them, and you can extend OpenFlow. There's this concept of vendor extensions. But it doesn't, out of the box, give you the same ease of adding uh, extensions. Another one is new packet formats or fields. You're pretty much stuck with what it provides, and it's really hard to change that. You can do it through extensions, but they're not the cleanest way. You'd have to define an extension to add that one little field rather than adding that one little field on all the header uh, matches and all the flow entries you push down. But extensible matches are coming, specifically version 1.2, which is really great, especially for things like IPv6 and MPLS fields matching. Another thing is optical circuits. There's no way to represent a TDM, a time division multiplex circuit. This may change in the future. We'll see. Another thing is low setup time individual flows is absolutely a limitation of, it's a fundamental uh, limitation of open flow that there will be some setup time but the implementations right now will often have a 1 to 10 millisecond delay if you're lucky and if your flow rate is fairly low. If you want to push way more flows than that, you may need to be careful in, with the implementations you choose and possibly even at the controller selectively filter those entries. So where is it going? OpenFlow 1.0 was released at the end of 2009. This one was targeted at the campus, trying to make it usable for researchers and especially for the Genie project, which is a big collection of campus resources to do, for students to do networking experiments and researchers in general to do networking experiments. OpenFlow 1.1 was released March 1st, 2011. This was implemented, but it was implemented in software and it hasn't been implemented to my knowledge in hardware yet, although it is capable of being implemented in hardware. So this is the into the WAN OpenFlow version, and there are three major changes that help out in the WAN. First one is multiple table support. Eliminating that cross-product problem of layer two, layer three, access control, or whatever organization of tables you have. Another one are tags and tunnels. So often you may want to forward to a virtual port, or you may want to tag a packet and do label switching along a path like what MPLS does. So before 1.1, there was no way to implement MPLS with an open flow. This gives you a way. So MPLS and VLAN. So VLAN's actually a big deal. OpenFlow 1.0, either there is no VLAN and you add it, or if there is one, you modify it. But you can't stack, you can't uh, encapsulate the packet to add a VLAN. So often there's uh, 802.1, I think it's Q, does uh, VLANs, where you can have two VLANs, and one might be what the customer is using, and another is uh, what you use to route their, that customer's traffic. So it can be really handy to have two VLAN tags instead of one. But OpenFlow 1.0 didn't give you any sane way to match on that. And then the last thing is multipath forwarding. In a data center, you probably want to use something like equal cost multipath. And as well as in the WAN, if you want to spread traffic across two links, it really comes in handy to have a primitive exposed through OpenFlow that allows you to spread that traffic. 
And there's a primitive. It isn't actually specific to ECMP. It says, here's a, a notion of groups. And within these output groups, it's actually, it's more than just output ports. It's modifications. So you can modify a packet going in two different directions in two different ways. Uh, it allows you a way to implement traffic spreading or sampling across that. And then OpenFlow 1.2 was recently approved. I think it's in a, a step where they're waiting to make sure there are no patent issues with it. And this is kind of extensible protocol. That's the big deal with 1.2. Extensible match, extensible actions, adding support for IPv6, which Carrier said is an absolute requirement, makes sense, as well as a little primitive to support multiple controllers for the controller to change the role of the switch. OK. I'm going to talk about controllers for a little bit. So the list of open controllers is growing. It used to be the OpenFlow reference, which was a simple C learning switch, didn't do much. And then it was Knox that came out, I think, end of 2008, 2009, which allows you to program in C++ or Python. And it's implemented for Linux, GPL'd. Nasira originally came up with that. Uh, it's actively supported outside of Nasira now. But since then, there have been a number of controllers that arose because people weren't happy with the language choices and preferred something like Java or Ruby or JavaScript even or because they didn't feel that the system was scaling as, as far as it should. So Beacon is one example of a controller created to fill a gap in the controller space, give people more options. The core is GPL'd, but there are uh, other licenses for your code. So it's, it's a little different than the usual licensing agreement. David Erickson is the original author. He's going to be here later today. You should absolutely talk to him if you, intend to, if you think you might want to program in Java. It has some uh, really nice features like it's runtime modular, so you can swap pieces in and out. If the piece, like the web server breaks, you can replace just that part without disrupting your forwarding. Um, it has all kinds of other things, like regression test framework, web UI. Maestro, I'm not as familiar with. This is another Java controller. Trema, you're going to hear more about later. So I'm going to skip the full details on it, but I will say that it has this regression test framework built in, which is really cool, along with an emulator. So the Trema guys are thinking more than just the controller. They're thinking about the entire picture of how you efficiently build an SDN application and test it and deploy it. And then RouteFlow, I'm going to show you a video on that. Uh, Christian Stev Rothenberg, raise your hand. Is he here? Uh, maybe he stepped out for a moment. I know he's here, so he'll be able to answer questions on that. That's a project that doesn't aim to implement a completely open controller platform on top of which you can do anything with OpenFlow, but instead give you the ability to define new IP services. So you'd never use OpenFlow messages, but you would do BGP-like things or new ways with IP configuration. And then there are a bunch of others. OpenFaucet is a library to make it easier to build controllers. Mirage is a, a framework in OCaml for building networking applications. These things aren't quite controllers, but they can help you build one. And at this point, I just kind of gave up because there are so many. And in fact, Martin did a really great thing. He has a blog post from, I think, a few weeks ago, end of March, where he added a list of all the software projects that he knows about. And this includes software switches, all the, all the things that you can download immediately off the web, including switches, controllers, things that aren't quite either of those, like testing tools, as well as applications, so controllers that are specific to an application built on top. OK, we have about 10 minutes. And I want to briefly survey related research to OpenFlow and SDN. And for almost all of these projects, you won't hear anything more about them the rest of today. But just see this as a list of pointers to projects you may want to check out to learn a new way that OpenFlow can be used or that you can think of SDN. Uh, and we'll get these slides up that I'm showing now. Let's, I'll do it around noon. So the first one is DFANE, which is do it fast and easy. And it's a way to think of, a way to address the problem of limited table space. So if you have a single flow table and your entries don't fit, what you might do is realize that you have other switches in your network that do have entries and think of algorithms to split up the rules, to partition those rules so that packets are always handled in the data plane, even though they may need to take an extra hop through the data plane. Because that hop through the data plane is much faster than any switch packaging the packet, sending it over TCP, waiting for that acknowledgment, waiting for the controller to see the packet, act on it, and insert flow entries or do some action in response to that packet. Uh, another one is the UCSD fat tree series. You got a preview of that earlier. Hetera is, is one of the later examples. Uh, that's how do we 
design a data center topology, and then once we've designed it, how do we use the rules efficiently? And then how do we use, in the case of Portland, specifically, how do we use OpenFlow to build the thing in practice? And there are some other data centers that people have built on top of OpenFlow. So Dave Erickson and I set one up in Atlanta that has about uh, 160 nodes right now, and that's going to increase, and that's thanks to Google's help. So major props to Google there. Another existence proof that you can build large data center networks with OpenFlow. Another one is Tesseract. This is SDN before it was called SDN, so it's worth looking at for the uh, architectural principles. And there it was. The idea is a centralized WAN in this uh, 4D architecture, which has planes to disseminate data, to discover things, to make decisions. And I think there's one other D that I'm forgetting. That's a way to think about a hierarchy of controlling wide area networks. Another one is Onyx. Onyx is the first example, to my knowledge, of a distributed controller that works on top of open flow switches. So if you're building a wide area network especially, or you're building a data center and you need to have at least one, more than one controller, you need to have that fault tolerance built in, then you need to use distributed systems techniques to share data between those two controller instances, as well as the instances of applications that run on top of those controller nodes. And Onyx provides an existence proof that this can be done and some discussion on what those distributed systems uh, protocols and methods might be. Specifically, it has two options for distributing state. And each of them has different properties. One is applications that are operating on top of this, this network graph that Onyx provides can use a distributed hash table, kind of like what Amazon uses for your shopping cart, which is prioritized for availability but there may be a brief window of time where your shopping cart is inconsistent. And at least for Amazon, that in inconsistency means your shopping cart has an item that you didn't add, or you deleted it, but it hasn't actually been deleted. And you can resolve that. Right? That's, that's how it works inside Amazon. Or their applications, in some cases, actually store a log of all possible versions they've seen and then reconcile them after the fact. Uh, a distributed hash table is one way to build a system like this that spreads your data across a set of nodes such that if any node dies, you can still find your data. It stores copies and makes sure it's always available. Onyx has that approach, which gives applications this uh, eventually consistent data store. It also builds on top of a distributed database, which is a closer coupling of those nodes implementing the controller. But it has the negative of there's delay to ensure that both sides see the same view and synchronize it. And DevoFlow is. I think of it as an analysis of how OpenFlow works in the data center and some changes to the interface. One example is, is rule cloning. Push down a rule to a switch as a wildcard, but allow the switch to internally implement that wildcarded rule as uh, exact match rules and to track what's going on with those exact matches. So it's a way of partitioning the effort slightly differently that pushes back on the switches a little bit more in a way that helps the controller to scale. All right, one more page. This is uh, language or more abstraction work, so really high-level stuff. I think this is where the action is right now, to be honest. So one, uh, one real, really great example is functional reactive programming, which is a really scary phrase. Uh, but it means functional programming applied to things where event, areas where events are occurring, like an open flow-based network. The advantage is when you just start with something like a Knox program, that other program that you add may use flow entries in a different way, and there's no way to compose the two. There's also no way to easily analyze the two. It's a lot like when you have two different threads. If you don't know exactly how they're modifying data, if you have no synchronization primitives, you may modify da data in ways that are unpredictable and hard to fix. So race conditions come across when you have, we try to compose programs, and each program doesn't know exactly what the other one is doing and doesn't synchronize properly around the state. So Frenetic and Nettle are two projects uh, Frenetic, uh, I, think, I think Nate Foster is going to be at the uh, ONS later today. I think I saw him earlier. He's one of the authors of that. And then Resonance, this comes out of Georgia Tech. And this is a system for them to more easily manage their campus network where the logic is implemented as a state machine. So a student connected their laptop. Have they been virus checked? If they have not been virus checked, then put them on a different network and make sure they can't infect anyone else. 
that's an example of a state machine kind of approach of there are states associated with users at a higher level. These are higher level entities than the flows in OpenFlow, but it's a way of thinking about and programming an OpenFlow or, or SDN network. And the last one is uh, consistency primitives. This is a recent workshop paper from Hotnets last year. And this provides per packet or per flow routing guarantees to simplify network versioning largely. So one way to run your network is I compute what my network should be right now. I push that down. I compute what my network should be next based on the changes that I saw in this time window. And every so often in lockstep, I push down my new network configuration. This is very different than how things work today, but it has these advantages of you being able to analyze that network and possibly even test that configuration before it sees any packets. Then when you switch over to it, you can be sure that you're not going to have things like routing flaps. Uh, some of the consistency primitives work. I think the, the paper name is pretty cute. Change you can believe in, double meaning there. Uh, consistency primitives to simplify the programmer's job. And I think we're going to see more of these, just like we see abstractions for programming multi-core uh, PCs. Things like transactional memory, threads, locking, mutexes, all these different forms of state synchronization.